Still, good morning, everybody. All right, so for the next 20 to 25 minutes, we're just going to talk about some of the um, practical day-to-day -day changes in the law that are going to affect and benefit employees, um, often and unfortunately to the detriment of uh, the employers and organizations uh, that rely so heavily uh, on those individuals. Uh, we're going to specifically look at New York State minimum wage, uh, the new Paid Family Leave Act, which goes into effect on January 1st of next year, and New York City's new Freelance Isn't Free Act. Uh, we're going to look at developments in the law both for 2017 and going forward. Uh, specifically with New York State's minimum wage increases. As part of the 2016-17 budget, the legislator, legislature enacted a statewide $15 per hour minimum wage plan. New York is across the country at the forefront of increasing minimum wage for good reason. The cost of living in the state of New York is higher than it is in most other areas. And the idea behind increasing the minimum wage gradually over the next several years is we're trying to get to a point where a New York resident can live on minimum wage if they work 40 hours uh, a week at that rate of pay. The increase is going to happen at different rates depending on where you work. Let's look at three different uh, categories, New York City, Long Island, Westchester, and then the remainder of New York State. New York City has been broken into two different categories, big employers, which means 11 or more employees, and small employers, which mean 10 or less. As you can see uh, from the chart behind me, New York City's large employers are going to ramp up to that $15 an hour number the fastest. The uh, idea behind that being most of the people who work in those uh, companies also live within New York, has the highest cost of living in the state, and therefore we need to really get those people up to a living wage as quickly as possible. Uh, the distinction between the, the large and small employers for New York is really has less to do with the employees that work for those companies and the economic impact it's going to have on the companies and organizations that employ them. We'll speak more about that in a couple minutes. Long Island and Westchester, as far as I'm concerned, are the areas that are being hit the hardest by this simply because we don't have necessarily all of the economic advantage of being in the city and having the cachet of being in the city, but you're so close to the city that the cost of living is at the very least believed to be by the legislators, most of whom are not from around here, that it costs just as much to live down here. We need to ramp up minimum wage almost as quickly for people who live in the suburbs as we do for people who live in the city. So although New York City employees are gonna jump to $15 at the end of 2018 and 2019, by the end of 2021, uh, every, every person that works on Long Island is going to be making at least $15 per hour. The distinction between what I'll call the suburbs and the remainder of New York State is we don't even know how long it's going to take the rest of the state to get to $15 an hour yet. But the people that voted on this, the legislators that voted on this from all over the state have put a huge economic uh, responsibility on employers in this area to fund the lives of minimum wage workers, and we're going to have to figure out how to live in that new reality. Um, you know, the, the focus on ensuring a livable wage is admirable. It's going to put an enormous amount of stress on downstate employers, and especially not-for-profits. Uh, what's the practical effect of this? Um, obviously, the cost of labor is going to increase rapidly. And organizations that rely on fewer, harder working employees will be the hardest hit. Who does that often affect most? Not for profits. So, how is it going to impact not for profits? You're going to have not only increased payroll, but you're going to have to redistribute your work. 
and find more people who are willing to do this type of work because overtime is going to eventually become cost prohibitive. Let's take a look at an example. Patty owns a not-for-profit, currently employs 10 people. She's doing really, really good work. All of her employees do really good work. They all have signed on to work for minimum wage and they all put in about 60 hours a week. That labor currently costs her not-for-profit about $7,000 a week in total. Once minimum wage hits $15 an hour at the end of 2021, the same amount of work is being done, the same amount of good work is being done, the same amount of benefits being received, but the cost of that same amount of labor is jumping from $7,000 to over $10,500 every single week. And $4,500 of that is just in overtime alone. So now Patty's not-for-profit is forced to spend administrative time, administrative resources to go out and recruit more employees. Because if you can avoid paying overtime to get that same amount of work done, you see the benefit of saving over $1,500 a week. That's a great benefit, but in order to get that benefit, you're gonna to have to find additional people who are willing to do this type of work and are willing to be as diligent about it and as committed to the cause as the 10 people that you already have. It's a lot of administrative, it's gonna be an administrative nightmare. It's going to cause uh, not-for-profits to do more work, but doing less of the work that they really got into, into this business to do. So the question is, is there a solution to the minimum wage problem in New York? Yes and no. Uh, <laughs> Robots may be the, uh, may be the answer in the end. Um, it's unlikely that any of these increases are going to be repealed. There's far too much support in the state of New York uh, for working families, and the idea of a living wage is something that has been wholeheartedly embraced in our state. So I would not hold your breath that $15 an hour is suddenly going to roll back. So small employers, um, not-for-profits, uh, companies that employ a workforce that is down near the bottom of the wage scale are going to have to look for creative solutions. Um, and one of the things that we've been talking about, and I represent a lot of companies that employ uh, workforces that make at the, at this year $10, $11 an hour, maybe $12 an hour. And over the course of the next three or four years, they're, they're – um, salary structures are gonna be compressed because the lowest paid employees are gonna be paid more and it's gonna become difficult to increase the wages of those people above them. So what are ways that we can try and um, put pressure on your lawmakers to help alleviate some of the burden that you're going to be taking on to support uh, minimum wage workers? Um, one idea is for tax credits to help build businesses in this area, to put money back into businesses, to try and help businesses grow. It is when you offer a tax credit for a company to take advantage of that is only incentivized by continuing to keep your business here, it does two things. One, it encourages businesses to stay in this area. And we have great concern that Increased minimum wage is going to drive companies out of this area if there's not some type of collateral relief. The other thing that it does is it diffuses the overall economic effect from just those businesses that employ minimum wage workers in this area across the state. Because if the entire state is worried about minimum wage workforces, and especially in this area, then I don't think it's unreasonable for the businesses and not-for-profits and other organizations on Long Island to look to the rest of the state for support in following through on their mandates. Do you have a question? I did. I don't know if any of the microphone though. I'm just wondering, I'm curious how it actually does affect um, Long Island nonprofits only because the only you know, idea that I can think of is like group homes, for example, that do employ um, care workers. But even my friend, 
trying to test my work for public thinking about the Middle East. They are trying to make it a little more lucrative. Um, you know, small nonprofits, we do have workers who do a lot, and we're not usually paid to do this. I'd say it's nine slaves, 15 an hour at this point. So I'm just wondering if it's this now is almost like what is that for them? Work on it and these big, you know, companies like that would have many workers doing work overtime, for example. So I'm just curious if what the experience is for the nonprofits. There may be hostels, I'm not sure, but I don't, I don't see how that would. Well, to, for for the people in this room who who know what the employees in in your organizations make, how many of you know you employ at least one person who's making less than fifteen dollars an hour right now? Okay, so the, there are there are organizations that are well funded and can afford to recruit. Um, make their positions more attractive and recruit at a higher rate. But I know that there are many uh, not-for-profits on Long Island uh, that don't have that ability to offer higher, higher starting wages. And is $10 an hour unreasonable? No, it may not be. But the, the, the problem is going to compound quickly over the next couple of years because what seems doable at $10 an hour in 2017 may start to make your throat tighten up at $12 in 2019. And by 2021, you know, you may really start to be feeling the crunch. And I think it's worthwhile for employers, especially not for profits, um, to look at this as a three or four year uh, economic impact rather than just at, at what it's going to do this year. Ken? So when, we, when you start to think about what the practical ways to deal with, not, not looking to as like lobbyists, but when you're starting to look at what the practical ways of dealing with an increased minimum uh, wage are, I hear two things a lot. Well, I'm going to have to make everybody's salary. No. And I'm going to have to start relying more on interns and volunteers. Again, please don't do that because you're, you're running yourself into a buzzsaw. Um, nothing has changed about the duties test and, and who is properly exempt. Um, you do still have a, a minimum salary requirement uh, that I do anticipate will go up. But regardless of what the minimum salary uh, requirement is and whether you're hitting that number, if the person that you're trying to pay salary is not properly classified as a salaried employee, they are entitled to... Uh, overtime over 40 hours and the failure to properly pay overtime can be crippling if you run into either a Department of Labor audit or have an issue uh, with a disgruntled employee filing uh, a lawsuit which could either become a collective action or a class action. So, you know, this is really not a um, employee classification um, seminar, but, you know, 
don't don't try and pay somebody a salary unless they're truly a supervisor that spends more than half of their time supervising the work of at least three or more um, other full-time employees or if they're um, actually making decisions on a day-to-day -day basis that affect your entire organization or unless they um, fall into a couple certain very specific um, jobs most employees uh, in the state of New York should be paid an hourly wage and should not be paid on a salary basis. So if you have questions about whether somebody can be salaried, please ask myself or another um, employment lawyer before you go ahead and just put that person on salary. It can't be done for your convenience. It can't be done even for their convenience. Yes? Um, we're talking about solutions to this issue. The issue is increased costs my idea is is government responsibility to take care of most of the people that live there. They are mandated by law. So if you a solution is forcing government to pass along some kind of care, you know, tell us to take away the compassion of the minimum wage to our lower paid workers. Yeah, I, I'm not. It's it's going to be. Let's keep this on a state level, just so this doesn't blow up into a huge, uh, you know, what the federal government is at this point, what it's going to be in six months. But but even from a state government point of view, look, the compaction of the wage scale is a very. It's going to be a very real side effect. Of, of the minimum wage increase because there are several organizations, there's, there's organizations all over Long Island where your supervisors are making $15 an hour right now or $16 an hour and they're, and they're supervisors because one, they've put in time, they've, they've, they've demonstrated their value to you, they've demonstrated their responsibility and they've demonstrated their willingness to help grow the next generation of your organization and at this point they may feel like that additional work and that additional skill set and that additional experience is all being recognized because they do make more money it's going to be difficult to continue to recognize their additional service by continuing to raise their um, their hourly wages at the same rate that the minimum wage is going up and if they don't rise at the same rate you're going to see a compression of that wage scale, which is going to disenfranchise your, your more experienced workers, your more skilled workers, and your supervisory workers. And that is one of the biggest, that, that's another concern that's raised by the increase in minimum wage. It, yes? Um, I had a question regarding summer camp counselors. Are they exempt from the minimum wage increases? Yes. Summer camp is in the summer camp's a different world. So um, yes, they are exempt, but you have to make sure that they fall into that summer camp exemption exemption. So I'm making that as a broad statement and not telling you that any specific camps, summer counselors are are exempt. If you need more information about that, we can we can talk about it. Okay. Yes. Well, you, you mentioned before uh, the possibility of tax credits uh, to offset the impact on the NPOs, uh, increased uh, minimum wage, uh, like the liabilities. Uh, I'm a little curious as to how you envision this working. 
unless an NPO has significant UBIT tax, how are they going to ever get a credit? I, I only offered that as one example of, of an alternative solution. So I think that the, it, it, it was intended to be illustrative of the fact that you're not going to get a repeal of this minimum wage. So whether it's tax credits, whether it's, um, w whether it's any other indirect benefit which offsets the impact that the increased minimum wage is going to have, that's the direction you have, you're have. you going to have to look because the legislature is not going to roll back minimum wage and you're still going to have to, if you want your organization to continue doing as much good work as it is, you're going to have to continue to employ just as many, if not more people, that cost is going to continue to rise. We're going to have to find other ways to pressure, if not convince, lawmakers to help take some of that burden. Can we really fire up this crowd to talk a little bit more about internships and volunteers and how those kind of come together? Okay. <laughs> Interns are not a labor force. Um, in, interns can be of a great, look at interns as your next generation. When you have interns in your organization, you're making an investment in them. They're not making an investment in you. Um, so when we talk about what a proper unpaid internship is, it's think of it as the exception to the rule and not the rule itself. I generally tell people that if you have an unpaid intern, I hope you got them directly from a college and I hope you confirmed that they're getting credit at their college for, for doing your internship. And if they're not, my default, unless you can really give me a convincing reason otherwise, is you have to pay them at least minimum wage. Um, interns that are doing work that is normally done by paid personnel, you need to pay. Interns that are giving the the business that they're interning with more benefit than the company is giving them benefit, you need to pay those people. So I, I come across a lot of employers that, that tend to use interns as free summer labor. And you run into a huge issue with that down the road because somebody's not going to like their internship. And somebody's going to complain about that internship at a backyard barbecue. And at that backyard barbecue, there's going to be a lawyer there. And the lawyer's going to say, well, how, were they paying you? No, they didn't even pay me. Now you've got a problem. And not just with that intern, but potentially with every intern you've had at your organization in the past six years. So if you're not getting interns directly from accredited colleges for college credit, the default is to pay them. As far as volunteers are concerned, volunteers are in, in some ways the backbone of not-for-profits, and especially in fundraising. So if you're having a golf outing, you know, you're going to ask people to volunteer to help um, run that outing and get everything set up and put the tea signs out and put the, the coolers out on, on the tea boxes and all of that. You're gonna ask people to help clean up at the end of the day. Make sure that when people are volunteering um, to help your organization, that they don't do work that you, other, that you would otherwise pay people to do. Volunteers don't answer phones. Admin staff answers phones generally. So if it's something where a secretary would usually do the job, but you know, you have, an, you have a volunteer that week, let the volunteer do whatever the other work is. Don't take your paid personnel off of their job to go do the volunteer work, even if it sounds better and that's what they really want to do that week because it's really nice out this week and, you know, I'd like to get some sun. No, you can't have volunteers do work that is normally done by your paid personnel because if you do have them do that, you should be paying them. They become employees. Any other questions about inter... Yes. Is it okay to pay an intern 
return on a project basis, that's fixed fee, if you will, as opposed to an hourly basis? Yes, if you shouldn't, if they are really a, I'm sorry, did you say interns or volunteers? Interns. Intern. Let's say a uh, young, uh, let's say someone um, is a marketing graduate, marketing degree, in between jobs, and I would say, could you do a marketing plan for me for $500? Is that, as in, is that okay? Are you telling them where to do it? No, I'm giving I'm giving them general parameters that they can work for them. Are you telling them when to do it? No. Are you telling them how to do it? No, I just want the results. All right. Okay, that's what I'm ultimately looking for. If you're not telling them where to do it, how to do it, where to do it, you're not giving them the materials to do it, you're not reimbursing them for the, for their supplies. Can you pay an intern on a fixed fee basis? You can, but that's really because they're operating as an independent contractor, not as an intern. And you're paying them as an independent contractor because you're giving them a task. You're saying, when it's done, I'll pay you. I don't care when, how, why, or how it gets done. Just please get it done, and when you get it done, I'll pay you to do it. Now, we'll get into that and how, how New York's freelances and free law has impacted that type of relationship. If you're out here on the island, you don't need to listen to that part of it, but if you have any operations in the city, we'll get into how that's been affected. I've got seven minutes. All right, we're gonna fly. New York's paid family leave law. If you employ more than one person, uh, paid family leave is going to impact you. Paid family leave goes into effect January 1st, 2018. However, next week you can start collecting employee premiums for, to make sure that you can make your premium payments uh, by January 1st. If you start collecting um, payroll deductions, we'll get to the amount in just a second, make sure you segregate them, okay? Don't put them into your general operating account, don't use them to pay rent, don't use them to make payroll, put them aside and use them for what they're supposed to. Remember, this law hasn't gone into effect yet. If it doesn't end up going to effect for some reason, you're going to be responsible to return all that money to the employees, okay? Uh, what's the purpose of paid family leave? To bond with a child, to care for a loved one who has a serious health condition, or to provide time off family members of active military personnel. The person taking the leave can't be the person who's having the child, can't be the person who's sick, and can't be the military personnel. It has to be to care for or to assist someone else in your family in all three of those circumstances. Private employers with more than one employee are covered, so yes, you are covered. Um, there are other eligibility requirements for the employees that are allowed to take uh, paid family leave, but generally assume that if this person's been working for you for more than six months, they will be eligible. Um, you're allowed to take up to eight weeks for parents to bond with a child. Any time within the first year that that child is born, adopted, or placed into foster care. So if you have um, a marketing executive who has a baby in September, you're not off the hook. That person can take eight weeks to bond with their child through the following September. They have to take it in at least one day increments, but they can spread it out. It does not have to all be taken at one time. Um, uh, serious health conditions, it can't be yours. Active duty deployment, if somebody else in your family is deployed on active military duty, you can take the leave. If you're the one being deployed, you can't get paid for that leave. Um, we talked about how a family leave can be taken. Two spouses that uh, work for the same organization can both take the leave, they just can't take it at the same time. So if you have a husband and wife that work for you, the wife can take eight weeks off. A week later, when she after she gets back, the husband can take eight weeks off. So the economics are gonna be phased in. In 2018, you're gonna have eight weeks of leave. The following two years, 10 weeks of leave, and, the, and beyond that, 12 weeks of leave. <coughs> the percentage of salary that those people are gonna be paid. And remember, they're not being paid by you, they're being paid by a state insurance fund that's being funded by employee uh, payroll deductions. 
It's going to start at 50%. 50 it's going to uh, jump up to 67%, capped at New York State's average weekly wage, which is a little over $1,300 a week this year. So it's pretty high. That's over $36 an hour. Okay? Um, the employees are paying for this. Their total contributions capped at that $1,300 number for a year, and it can't be more than $1.65 every week. Um, what are your responsibilities? Notify your employees that paid leave is coming. Ensure you have proper postings in the work area. I would start taking deductions June 1st or July 1st of this year. You do not want to be fronting the premium that you could have been collecting in the second half of this year. Just give me one second, please. And then um, make sure that you have a family leave policy in your employee handbook. Yes? Well, I just want to clarify premium requirements. Uh, I think the only reason why you would want to collect premiums prior to the effective date of the benefit is if you were self-insuring the benefit. If you don't include an insurance company, the insurance company is going to take on the risk and the liability. So therefore, you don't have to start paying premiums until the effective date. You, you don't have to start paying the, the premiums anyway, but you're, you're allowed to start taking those. I, I think I disagree with you because otherwise you're trying to catch up from the premium that, that you're paying. Well, there's a maximum amount of money that you can take from an employee. Correct. It's going to be an employee pay. There's no... Um, pressure on a company to pay for this benefit. Um, and there's a maximum amount you can take on a regular basis. So if you're not self insuring it, it's an insurance company that's taking risk, and you don't have to worry about paying the premium until the effective date. My understanding is you have to fund the premium anyway. So whether you're collecting it up front and then paying out of what's been collected or whether you're paying the premium and then and then collecting it after the fact, I'd rather be paying out of somebody else's money. I think, I think the point here is I think the insurance company is going to be asking for the money at the very beginning. Yes. So you're going to have to collect the money and then collect it from your employees. So by taking the money now, you've got the money set aside to give it to the insurance company on January 1st when they ask for that first premium. Otherwise, you're, you as an employer are going to have to lay out the money and wait to get the money from the employer. Right, but I'm actually glad you take the employees. Think of it as the 60 cents a week you're taking already now. Okay, so your other responsibilities. When people, when, when people tell you that they want to take family leave, process their, their request promptly. Grant conditional leave if the insurance company is dragging their feet on letting you know whether they're going to approve it. Um, put contingencies in place. This is especially important for very small employers and for very small organizations. Remember, if you have four employees, you may lose 25% of your workforce for up to eight weeks. How are you going to deal with that? Are you going to cross-train your other employees so that they can absorb those job responsibilities? or are you going to go try and find temporary help to fill in? If you're gonna try and find temporary help to fill in, we have to be proactive and make sure that that temp is going to have proper instruction on how to do, the, do their job, or else you're not gonna maximize uh, the benefit of having the temporary help. Uh, Lena, how does the fee FMLA affect public difference state, county, town, et cetera, employees? It doesn't. Paid family leave, the, the question was, how are public employees affected by paid family leave? Um, my understanding is that paid family leave uh, affects only employees of private employers with more than one employee. So as I read the statute, it does not affect public employees. All right, Ken's giving me the hook. So. In the next 30 seconds, I'm going to explain to all of you what New York City's Freelance is and Free Act. If you use uh, freelancers, which means independent contractors that are one person, 
you now need to have written contracts with them. Get the contract written, get the contract signed before they start work. Once they start work, you cannot renegotiate it and you're gonna owe them the money even if you're not happy with the job that they did. Okay, if you'd like more information on the Freelancers and Free Act, please speak to me uh, when we're all done. Thank you very much.